Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday, everyone. Yeah. It is Palm Sunday, the beginning of what we call Holy Week. Amen. Amen. Matthew 21 says this. I'm going to read you some scripture that tells you this. Uh, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and placed that colt, their cloaks, on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And everybody said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest heaven, Jesus' name. Well, we get to worship Jesus today. Here we go. And they say, today is the day the Lord has made, right? You can stand if you want. Don't get locked into a chair if you have to, if you want to. behind I'm setting my heart and mind on you Jesus I'm reaching my hand to yours believing there's so much more knowing that all you have in store for me is good is good today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it I won't worry about tomorrow I'm trusting in what you say today is the day today is the day Putting my fears aside, I'm leaving my doubts behind. I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you, Jesus. Yeah, I'm reaching my hand to yours, believing there's so much more, knowing that all you have in store for me is good is good today is the day you have made i will rejoice and be glad in it today is the day you have made i will rejoice and be glad in it i won't worry about tomorrow i'm trusting in what you say today is the day Today is the day, today is the day, today is the day. I will stand upon your truth. my days I live for you. And all my days I live for you. And I will stand upon your truth. I will stand upon your truth. And all my days I live for you. All my days I live. Today is the day 
you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it I won't worry about tomorrow I'm giving you my fears and sorrow where you lead me I will follow I'm trusting in what you say today is the day today is the day yeah. today is the day oh today is the day
amazing. You knew what you were going through and what you were getting ready to go through, but you did it anyways. And you did it for us. And I pray this morning for those who are in need that you will be their supply. I pray for those who are hurting, that you'll be their health and your strength. I pray for those who are mourning, that you'll be the comfort in their time of sorrow. I pray, God, those who are lost, that you'll be their salvation. I pray for those that just are, are without direction, that you will be that pathway, that, that new gateway into a new life. And so, Father, thank you for all you've given us. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. And now let us worship and give him praise, church, in Jesus' name. Amen. He became sin who knew no sin that he might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and buried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Emmanuel, the rescue from sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, His body the bread, His blood the wine, humbled and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing, yeah. It's Jesus Messiah. Messiah, Lord of all, yeah. all our hope is in you, all our hope is in you, all your glory to you, God, the light of the Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, rescue for sinners, and ransom from heaven. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Lord of all, yeah, Lord of Put your hands together to give Jesus a clap offering this morning. Amen. You know, when he came into Jerusalem, it was 
an interesting time because the Israelites thought, all right, king is going to destroy our, our enemies, you know. Come in riding as a king on a big stallion, you know. That's usually what happened then. But the interesting thing is he came in on a donkey. And he wasn't about the king, political king. He was a king that was coming after your spirit and your heart. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. You're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song, let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. Let's sing that again. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire Inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. You are good, you're good, whoa. we open our hearts to you. We receive your love and receive your loving kindness. And he is jealous for me. 
blows like a hurricane. I am a tree spending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us. jealous for me loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. you go around, give somebody an invisible high five, and don't touch them elbow, elbow. Welcome each other. Amen. We want to uh, continue our, our worship this morning through our giving, and you guys may be seated. So if you are wanting to give in person today, there will be ushers at the door at the end of service, and if you would like to give the easy way, you can do online at tithely.com tithely and then just click on New Hope Fellowship. Um, this morning I was reading through Malachi 3.10 um, through 11. And it says, bring the whole tithe to the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. And see if I will not open and he says, throw open 
the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. And it goes on to say, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it's ripe. And he says, I will not let the tires on your cars wear down. I won't let your cars break down. I won't let the washer and the dryer break down. The shoes on your children's feet will last one more month. (laughs) And what this verse really speaks to me is that when we bring ourselves, our time, our finances to God, that he will protect and cover us with abundant blessings. And I think that we take that for granted too often. And so when we give our tithes, I mean, all of it is from God. And when we keep it for ourselves, we're actually robbing God. And he only asks us for 10%, not all of it, even though he gave us all of it. And when we are faithful in our finances and in our giving, He says he will bless us. And, you know, blessing is not just about the sacrifice. Or giving is not just about the sacrifice. Because when we get into our pockets, sometimes that might seem like a sacrifice. But it's God's way of ritually introducing us into the flow of sowing and reaping, um, which was part of his intention in creation. So this morning, as we tithe, as we give, um, let's pray. Lord, help us today to participate in the harvest that you have given us by sowing and reaping um, the benefits with you, Lord. Um, Everything that we have is from you, and we realize that this morning, Lord, and you're just asking us to be faithful to give just a part of it back into your ministry, Lord. And I just pray over everybody that's here today, bless the giver and the gift, and in everything we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, worship team, and God bless you. Hey, uh, would you open your Bibles to Mark chapter 16, and we want to look at uh, a story this morning that may seem a little odd because uh, it's not Easter Sunday yet, but uh, you'll find as we go through this this morning, I hope that it'll inspire you that when Easter Sunday comes, you're going to be even more greatly prepared and ready for what uh, God has for you and us and even outside of us. And so today I'm going to be a little unconventional and jump ahead to that first resurrection morning. And typically you'd hear a sermon like this on Easter Sunday, but uh, as I said, hopefully it'll make sense in a minute why I'm doing this, because some of the people involved in this story, one in particular, uh, there's a whole backstory that I think is going to inspire us and help us. And uh, we need those stories to inspire us to keep on and to persevere through whatever happens in our lives. You know, sometimes you you get hit by uh, something and it just knocks you for a loop. You know, I mean, you just get waylaid by things in life. But listen, this isn't on the screen, but I want to share a scripture out of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. And Peter says this, he says, But also for this reason give all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So there's faith, and he says add to your faith virtue. To virtue add knowledge, and to knowledge add self-control, and to self-control add perseverance. And perseverance add godliness. And so he's stacking these things up. He says add these things as you go along. And to godliness, add brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, add love. So he's got a whole list. Add these things. And then he says in verse 8, If these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so how many of you want to be fruitful? 
How many of you want to want to be uh, prosperous? And that's what Peter says. He says, so you add these things in your walk with Jesus. And so we're going to le- learn about someone today that was the hallmark of perseverance. And so we're going to go back several uh, passages in Scripture this morning because of the fact that I want us to see the, the full context of a story that's uh, part of it is in this gospel and part in this gospel and part in this. So we're going to jump around a bit, but I've got most of the uh, text on the slides for you so you can uh, follow along more easily than flipping. You know, sometimes in church when I grew up, you know, you have your Bible and, and you feel the breeze from everybody fanning the pages to get in there. And so today we have a little bit of uh, help with the overhead. But I miss the fact that people like... you. God bless you. you got your Bibles open over here, and, and it's awesome to see that because, you know, I don't know about you, but oftentimes I go, oh, man, I don't remember the, I, I don't remember the verse, chapter, and verse, but I know where it is on the page. You know what I'm saying? You know where it is. And so you open your Bible, and you go, there it is right there, middle of the second column. And that's the, the beauty of that, uh, that text. And so anyway, we're going to go back and, and learn about a story of someone who never stopped seeking, who never stopped pursuing, never stopped loving, never stopped serving, never stopped finding Jesus. And then on Easter morning, there's this capstone of this event and this, uh, this person's life. And so... Uh, you're wondering, okay, who is this? We'll get there in a minute. But some people have a never say quit attitude. As I said last last Sunday, my dad told me when I was a kid, he said, quitters never win, winners never quit. And I've never forgotten that. How about you? You know, that's one of those things that sticks in you and you just, I'm, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. And sometimes you need to look the devil straight in the eye and say, hey, you're not going to win, buddy. Amen? That's a prayer, by the way. It's kind of a rebuke. You're not going to win. I'm going to take you down because Jesus has already taken you down. Amen. So some people have that never say die attitude, and it's not always easy to maintain that. And that's why I read that verse out of Peter. He says, add to your faith perseverance, perseverance, stick with it. And that's a commodity today that sometimes is lacking, and uh, you've noticed that perhaps. And so um, churches in this season of, you know, one year ago we were shut down. We were only online, and so there were eight of us in the room with a camera and uh, had a little stand right here on a table and a cell phone, uh, using a cell phone as a camera to put the service out, and about eight of us here to try to make everything happen. Thank God. Amen. We've made it through a year. Can Can you say hallelujah? Can you say thank you, God? You know, we've survived, and... Uh, businesses are opening back up, restaurants, you can actually go in and sit down and have a meal. Isn't that awesome? And so uh, I love it. Thank you. And I also want to take a moment to say thank you to our staff. Thank you, Danielle, and thank you, Sound Booth team. Thank you, Michael and Michelle. Thank you, Rennell. And some of these are uh, out right now. Rennell, you know, with the baby. And and also Michael's in EMT training. He's in our ambulance this morning riding around Sacramento somewhere uh, learning about this opportunity. And so uh, a lot of things going on. But I want to say thank you to the hard work our staff has done. I want to say thank you to our church council uh, for helping us uh, manage things. I want to thank you for you Uh, The church, faithful, faithful people. And ultimately, I want to thank God and all you online for uh, hanging in and seeing us uh, through a challenging year. Amen? But there's one thing we've all learned, and that is the show must go on. Say that with me. The show must go on. And um, uh, you know that comes from uh, Broadway or Hollywood. You know, the show must go on. And that kind of, we're going to do this. And some of you have been in an entertainment industry. You know, sometimes you don't feel good. Sometimes something breaks. The show must go on. And that's the attitude that this person had. And so it's that kind of attitude that gives us the inspiration and the determination that's at the heart of this story That happened on the day Jesus rose from the dead. And it's the story of Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Now I know there's some uh, things that come out in the past few years. Alleging that Mary was. Because it's alleged that she was a prostitute. It's never said that in the Bible by the way. But you know people pick that up and said she was this and that and the other. And she and Jesus had this 
romantic relationship. That's baloney. That's a godly word, by the way, baloney. Say it with me. That's baloney. That stuff is un, not true. But turn to Mark 16, and here we go. Mark 16, chapter 16, verse 1. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, that would have been Saturday, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices. They were the spice girls that they might come and anoint him. And so very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Sunday morning, they're there at the tomb. Six o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, they're early. And so, and they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? And when they looked up, they saw the stone had already been rolled away. For it was very large. I've seen the, the place there, and you can't roll that stone. It was, it was like this big wheel in a track, and they would roll it over like a big millstone. I used to think it was like a round marble type stone, it, it, but they depict it as more of a, a wheel type stone that would roll over. And they sealed it with, uh, with a, uh, you know, like wax or whatever so they would know if anybody broke the seal. And so here they are. The stones rolled away. And entering the tomb, verse 5, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. <clears throat> and they were alarmed. Yeah, they would be. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter. Why do you think they emphasized Peter? Because you know what happened a few days before Peter. I don't know who he is. Is it gracious of God to say, hey, go tell Peter too, that he's going before you into Galilee, and there, there you will see him as he said to you. In verse 8, so they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. How many of you think you'd be just shook up? <laughs> you saw somebody buried, and you go back, to the bar and man, they're out of there. It's like empty and here's some angelic being sitting there talking to you yeah yeah that was wild so they went out quickly fled from the tomb for they trembled and were amazed and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid and when they now when he rose early on the first day of the week he appeared first to who mary magdalene out of whom he had cast seven demons and she went and told those who had been with him. And they mourned and wept, verse 11, when they heard it, that he was alive and had been seen by her. They didn't believe it. I'll bet they didn't. Because who would? Who would believe that? It took some doing. Forgive me for saying this, but here it is. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave is the greatest show in all of history. The greatest show in all of history. And with apologies to the circus and all of that, there's never been a greater show than this one. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's the hallmark of our salvation. It's the cornerstone of our faith. It's the hope we go to the grave with and it'll bring us through every valley of the shadow of death that we'll ever go through. That's our hope. The greatest show, and I don't know how you react to me calling it that. That's a little unconventional, Pastor. But if you look at that word in the dictionary, show in the dictionary, you're going to find another word which might surprise you, and the word is spectacle. Now, it's not these spectacles, it's a spectacle. And I never thought of the word spectacle in a sense of something that would be uh, associated with a resurrection, but it is. And if you look at Colossians 2.15, it's on the screen. Colossians 2.15 says this, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public, what? Spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. He's talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus. He made a spectacle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Paul literally said that when Jesus rose from the dead, a spectacle took place that confounded hell. It confounded the devil. The devil's thinking when those spikes are being driven into Jesus' hands and feet, he was winning. But in fact, those spikes were going into his coffin. Amen? They're going into the coffin of the devil himself. They're undermining him and everything he's about. And when Jesus rose from the dead, Satan thought he was going to do a victory dance. But guess what? He was hiding in 
shame because his whole plan was a now a train wreck. And you and I are the victors because of Jesus' victory. That's why we call it the greatest show, the greatest spectacle. It was a display of power unlike the world and hell had ever seen. And as a matter of fact, the devil thought he would drag us to the grave too, but hallelujah, ain't no grave big enough for me and you. Amen? Ain't no grave. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 13 says this, and it'll be on the screen. Why is it so important that we remember this, that we look at it as a spectacle, as a show, as something profound, greater than anything? Because Paul said, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Think about that. That's why it's so important. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He rose, folks. He died. He didn't slumber. He didn't go to sleep. He didn't pass out. They didn't put him on some narcotic for three days. He died. And he rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, death, hell, and the grave are no longer a threat to you and me. Amen? We live. So it gives us hope. And guess what? For this show, the spectacle, Mary Magdalene had a front row seat. She was first. And that amazes me. Mary had a front row seat to the greatest show because she was first in line to see it. She got to be part of it. But how did she get to that place of honor? And I want to talk about that this morning with you because if we're not careful, it was seen that it was just dumb luck. It just seemed a happenstance. It seemed like a fluke. It seemed like she just, right place, right time. No. There's a reason that I think we need to understand because it will inspire us in a greater way. So it wasn't luck. In fact, the result of a faithful life that led to this climactic victory for Mary. And for that, we go back to Luke chapter 8, which is another rendering of, this, uh, of the story of her life. And Luke 8, 1 through 3 says this, And it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women, say that with me, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. And Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward. Herod? He's the king. So she's got influence in the king's house. Amazing. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others provided for him from their substance. And when we think of Jesus' ministry, we often think of Jesus and the twelve going about and just, you know, he, uh, here's a couple sandwiches or a couple pieces of fish and Jesus blesses it and feeds 5,000 people. And another time he feeds 4,000. And every day you're thinking that they didn't need to go to McDonald's or Scott's Seafood or, or, or wherever. He just, you know, all of a sudden, boom, you know, food is provided. But you know what? They needed money when they traveled. They needed food. They needed lodging. They needed supplies. And guess where that money came from? These women. Pretty amazing. Same is true today. There are certain women here, certain men too, but every week, you faithful certain women, and I think that includes every single one of you ladies that are here today, certain women are faithful. You pray, you give, you serve, and you're the hallmark of faith. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. Well, Mary did these things, 
And that's how the disciples and Jesus did what they did because they had a, a background, they had a support team that Mary apparently had leadership in. Pretty incredible. So what it looked like, Mary called Magdalene out of whom had come seven demons, and I don't know how you count, but that's a lot of demons. Would you say it's a lot of demons? Now there's a lot of people today that have, I don't, I don't believe in demon possession. Well, I don't. I'm not going to argue with you, but she had something going on. Or something, some, something had something going on on her. This girl was in trouble. Her life was in shambles. She was being held hostage. But when she met Jesus, he set her free. And now she and several other ladies are faithfully serving just like many of you do right now today. And it says in verse 3 that she wasn't by herself in this. These other ladies were there too. And so for Mary, it wasn't a fluke that caused her to be able to see Jesus rise from the dead and get to be part of the most important story that's ever been. It was her way of life. Beginning when she started out at rock bottom, filled with seven demons, Jesus set her free. And from then on, she just was like a space shuttle of faith. With that in mind, we find that she was faithfully doing what she was doing. She appears at the tomb on that Easter morning. But how did she get there? John 20, if you turn there, John 20, verse 1 and 2, says it was the first day of the week. And Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, and while it was still dark, she saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb, and then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That would be John, by the way. Because John always referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loves. Isn't that a great way to refer to yourself? Go ahead and say it. You can say it about yourself. Say, hey, I'm, I'm Sam, the disciple that Jesus loves. <laughs> Doesn't that feel good to say that? I'm Jim, the disciple whom Jesus loves. Doesn't that feel good to just say that? I know you're a little hesitant at first, to, but it's true. It's true, and John captured that. So on the first day of the week, Mary came to the tomb early while it was still dark, saw the stone had been taken away. She ran and came to Simon Peter, the other disciple, and said, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. And verse 11, skip down to verse 11, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. Why? Because her Lord, she saw him buried on Friday. She's filled with sorrow She's in mourning. She's got an armful of spices. She's going to anoint the, the burial again. And then it says, she stooped down. She wept. She stooped down. She looks into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head of the, and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said, because they've taken away my Lord, I don't know where they've laid him. And when they said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. What would you have done at that moment? It was incredible. And Jesus says, verse 15, I don't think it's on the screen, but Jesus said, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she thought, maybe this is the gardener or something. But it was Jesus. And she said, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you laid him, I'll take, and I'll take him away. In verse 16, Jesus says, Mary. And she turns and says, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. And Jesus said, don't cling to me yet. It's not COVID, but <laughs> she said, I haven't ascended to my father. Say, tell people that when they want to hug you now. Say, wait, don't touch me. I haven't ascended yet. It'll freak them out. <laughs> but he says, go to my brethren and tell them I'm alive. I'm alive. So John's gospel includes a bit more of the and that's why it's important to read out of Mark and Luke and John and all these different Gospels because you get a little bit different insight into the story. And I hope it hits you harder now that you know her story. She might have begun with seven demons the first time she shows up, but now her story is all about a visitation with angels 
and the person of the risen Jesus. Incredible. And I think you'll agree with me that perspective helps to, to know a bit more about Mary Magdalene. It's no fluke that she's there. It's no random thing that she's there first in line on that Easter morning. The front row seat to the greatest thing in history. And as Mark put it, when she first got out and was sent by the angel, he told her to go tell Peter because he needs to know I'm alive. And she did. But what happened to make that miracle moment such a profound experience for her and us? What prepared her to be there? And what I'm really trying to say, church, is I'm preaching from this resurrection story today on this Palm Sunday so that we can more fully be prepared for an epic and miraculous Easter ourselves. You see, we've got a, we've got a week. And what's God wanting to do in you and me in this week? Like he prepared Mary, but he not only prepared her, she prepared herself. Mary spent from Luke 8 all the way to the end of the gospel getting ready to be at the right place at the right time. And I think it's significant for me because I want each of us to be poised to do all God has for us to do. So seven reasons why Mary showed up. I think seven, oh my gosh. Well, there were seven demons, so you've got to have seven reasons, right? One for each demon. Well, first of all, she had a heart of gratitude. That's number one. Say that with me. She had a heart of gratitude. Don't you love people that have a heart of gratitude? They're thankful. They're appreciative. Because the opposite of that is no fun. No fun at all. And she was a person of gratitude. And I believe if you had seven demons cast out of you, you'd be pretty happy about it too, wouldn't you? You'd be real thrilled. And how many of you know that you'd, you might not know what was in you, but Jesus got rid of it, and you're a happy camper now. Amen? Amen. Aren't you glad? It's good to look back and say, oh, thank God he set me free. Hallelujah. Now, it's possible about the seven demon thing that there were seven demons demons you know there was droopy and sleepy and no no not those guys but there was something tormenting her and also in scripture seven is used as a complete number to represent something full and complete like seven days in a week you know and seven notes on the musical scale things like that so either way it was a lot and so the idea is that when she first encountered Jesus, she was completely, totally, and fully given over to the influences in her life that were under the control of the enemy. And folks, there are a lot of people living on this street and on the street you live on and all around our community that are given over to the purposes of the enemy and they don't even know it. Amen? Because in this life, you've got two choices. You either surrender your life to the purposes of God and if you don't do that, then you've automatically already been surrendered to the purposes of the enemy. It's either or. It's never both. She was totally given over. And the Bible says the devil is a thief who wants to kill and destroy. He's a liar. And so Mary was a person who believed the lies of the enemy to the point that she was consumed and controlled by them. And so what this is telling us, what this is telling me, is that like so many people today, Mary was living her life under the domain of the darkness of the enemy and her life was under the control of the devil. No wonder the Bible says that she used her resources to support the ministry of Jesus. She had been set free, and of course she would do whatever she could for Jesus in the ministry because her life had been dramatically changed, and yours has too. But we can forget that. We can, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I know the Lord. Yeah, I go to church. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah I'm on the worship team, or yeah, I serve it. Yeah, I just go, and you know, I don't know. It's a whole Christian thing. It's not that big a deal. And you get that way if you're not careful. But don't ever take for granted what Jesus has done. Amen? Never. 
be grateful because grateful people always pivot to seek to be a blessing because they've received a blessing. And if you're grateful, you'll speak up. If you're grateful, you'll show up. If you're grateful, you'll stand up. If you're grateful, you'll say, praise God, and you'll give him thanks and praise, and you'll, you'll want to serve. You'll want to be there because you're grateful for what Jesus has done. And Mary understood that. Mary understood the gospel is free. Amen. Freely you've received, freely give, the Bible says. But she understood that it's not free to get the gospel out. That's why she supported Jesus' ministry. You need resources. She said, I can help. I can do that. Look, Luke 8 says, Mary took of her substance and supported the ministry that had given her new life. And in response, she said, I want more people to know Jesus. I want more people to be touched by Jesus like me. And so in gratitude, I'm going to help. And she did. She wasn't like the nine lepers who left Jesus and didn't come back. She was like the one leper out of the ten that came back and said, Oh, thank you, Lord. The second thing is not only she showed gratitude, she showed resilience. Resilience. Going through something like she went through her life, being demon-possessed, being at the darkest, would be easy to have been defined by that. It would have been easy for her to have her whole life defined by the difficulties she faced. And I think we've been all, all of us have been around people who've been brought through something difficult, but they're stuck. There's a difference between testimonies and what I call organ recitals. Do you know what organ recitals are? You ask somebody how they're doing, and they say, oh, man, my back's just killing me. And you wouldn't believe my toe is hurting. And, oh, God, I got something going on in my ear. And, you know, my heart's been acting up. And before long, they're giving you a whole concert. That's an organ recital. That's what an organ recital is. Don't do that. Testimonies are different. You say, you know, I wasn't doing so well, but thank God he set me free. He's touched me. I'm different. God wants us to know that if he heals our limp, we're not supposed to go around pretending we still have one. Amen? Amen. We're not to be defined by what we were, but defined by what we are now in him. And that's what Mary was like. I want to be, be like the man born blind. And in John chapter 9, when the Pharisees questioned him, he said, I was once blind, but now I see. Amen. Amen. Mary didn't have a victim mentality. She was more than a conqueror. Her life epitomized what the Bible says in Romans 8. Verse 37, yet in all these things, say it with me, all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That was Mary. She was resilient. And she was a victor. And my question for all of us this morning, are you allowing your life to be defined by the circumstances you were in? Are you defined by the victory that Jesus has now given you? And there's a difference there. Moses' name, by the way, this is a little aside, no charge for this one, but Moses' name means drawn out. Do you know why? He was drawn out. His name isn't put in. There's a difference. Moses, drawn out. What do you mean? I was, I was in trouble. God brought me out. That's Moses. So resilient gratitude, number three, Mary showed up. Say that with me. Mary showed up. And this is what allowed her to shine so bright. A little bit more about Mary would be to tell you that Magdalene was not her last name. You know, Christ is not Jesus' last name. You knew that, right? It wasn't Joseph and Mary Christ. No, it wasn't. It was Jesus. Christ is a title. And Magdalene for Mary was a title, and it came from the city that she was from, Magdala, or Magdala. And why is that important? Because Magdala was a very wealthy city. It was known for textiles and dyeing fabrics, and she was a merchant. She was involved in the, in the trade. She was prosperous. This lady was an influential person. She had means. Mary lived and worked on Rodeo Drive, if you will. She lived in Beverly Hills. She was at the peak. She could have been the Mary Versace of her day or one of these. 
just a little perspective. You think about Mary being like uh, somebody living under a bridge, eating out of garbage cans, robbing cars to buy drugs. That was not Mary. And when you think of somebody with seven demons, you know, we go, oh, man, they don't have any teeth left. And, you know, I mean, you know, you got the image. But that wasn't Mary. She had the finest clothes. She wore the finest shoes. Her hair was done. She had jewelry. She had money. She lived in a nice house. She had stuff. But she was full of the purposes of the darkness of hell. Pride. Arrogance. And you know a lot of people have a lot of stuff. And they've got a lot of baggage with it. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? And that was Mary. And when Jesus opened up her heart and got all that stuff out, she was changed. She was changed. And because she was changed, a woman that had everything in the world that she wanted, she found out what she actually needed, and that was Jesus. And now that she's saved, she wanted to use her influence and every resource she could to follow Jesus and to support his ministry. She didn't just show up for work, she also showed up for others. Number four, she showed up for others. She showed the way, she showed the way for others to do what she had done herself, and she shows up 12 times in the New Testament. 12 times, I counted them. And eight of those times, it's in connection with a list of other women. So apparently, she had a posse. She had some peeps. She had a group that were with her, and she influenced these people and said, hey, come on with me. We're going to follow Jesus. This week, I've been praying about something very specific, and I've learned this. You know, a lot of times we can say, Lord, save people. That's a very general prayer, and I don't think it's going to get very far. Because I believe with all my heart, God wants us to be specific when we pray. And this week I've been led to pray for influential people in our community. This morning I, I passed by a, a business, and I mean that business. I saw a helicopter landing there the other day because the guy that runs it comes in in a helicopter. And I said, Jesus, I don't know him, but you do. And if he doesn't know you, I want him to know you and everybody that works for him. Because you know what? You get a guy like that saved and get him on fire, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people that are going to be influenced by his decision to follow Jesus. Happens all over the world in missions. You get the tribal chief to come to Christ, the whole tribe comes. Why? Because it's influence. And I want you to join me this week, and I want to begin going by places and say, Jesus, there's a leader that lives there. There's somebody of influence that lives there, and I want people of influence saved and filled with the Holy Spirit so they can influence a lot of other people to know Jesus. Amen? Does that make sense to you? You bet it does because Mary was that person. And when she got turned on to Jesus, I guarantee you she went around, hey, get over here. We're following Jesus now. What do you mean? Get over here. I'll tell you when you get here. She was that kind of person. And some of you, church, some of you have way more influence that you know you do and you're not using it. Let it sink in. What influence do you have? You have a tremendous amount. And Jesus wants you to know you can use it for him. Amen. Mary showed the way for others. Number five, she showed courage. She showed courage. Mary had the courage to show her face at the cross. When Jesus died, Peter wasn't there. Bartholomew wasn't there. Thomas wasn't there. None of the disciples except John was there. Why? Because they were afraid that if they showed up, something would happen. Like they'd get arrested and hung up on a cross too. But Mary was there. She showed courage. And I think it's pretty powerful that someone marked by love was willing to show up like she did. And she was there with her friends. And they were there ready to roll up their sleeves and say, Jesus, how can I serve you? Hey, hang on two more minutes. There's two more. Number six, she showed emotion. She was not disconnected, but she was a woman that said, hey, Jesus touched my life, and I'm not ashamed to show some tears. I'm not ashamed to get a bit excited when I worship, amen? I mean, I grew up in a Baptist church. Thank God for my grandpa. You know, when we had worship, we didn't call it worship. We called it singing, and he held a book 
like this and you sang into the book pretty much and I've heard of churches where if somebody said hallelujah the ushers would come and say uh, we don't do that here but we do amen? amen had a lady come in one day in the church and she saw a box of Kleenex and she said why do you have Kleenex in church and I said because people get touched by God and sometimes they cry and she said oh, that happens in church yeah <laughs> I want it to happen more amen I want Jesus to show up. I want people to get touched. I'm not afraid to lay hands on people and see them, what we call slain in the spirit. You know, I mean, really touched by God where it knocks them out. I've seen that. I've also seen some people try to mimic it and push people down. And don't ever do that. Don't ever let somebody do it to you. But if it's real, if it's God, let him, have, let him take you in the operating room and do surgery on you for a few minutes. And it'll, it'll blow your mind. See, that stuff's real, church. We're not talking about a sleeping God. We're talking about God of the universe here. And Mary was willing to enter in and be touched at a deep level. How many of you say, I want more? I want to be touched deep in my soul by God. And last, she showed her true colors. And, you know, crisis shows your true colors, doesn't it? When you go through junk... Sometimes junk comes out. Going through hardship, going through a storm doesn't change who you are. It shows who you are. And this showed who Mary was. She showed up. She was full of gratitude. She was resilient. She showed the way for others. She did all, all these things and more, and that's seven of them. And for Mary, the worst day of her life, and the person she had given her life to, Jesus, was being murdered in front of her. She stands up. She stands up. And we know there's a difference for Mary. Because in John 20, verse 13, there are two words she says that shows the depth. And she said this, they've taken away my Lord. Say that with me. My Lord. So there's a difference in saying, you know, Jesus or God or, you know, I go to church and all that, but when you say my Lord, Lord, say that and mean it. Say, my Lord, Jesus, be my Lord. I surrender my life to you. I give you everything I have. I will follow you till my last breath on this planet. I will give my life and serve you to the best of my ability. I'll influence others for your cause. I'll lead the way so others can follow, Lord. I'll do that because you're my Lord. That's what Mary said, and that's what every one of us can say, if you will. So let me ask you a question. Who is Jesus to you? Who is he to you? You see, I think that's the most important question you will ever be asked on this planet. And Mary didn't say, he's the Lord. She said, he's my Lord. And that possessive pronoun has the capacity to change everything about your life and the lives of those you love and know. So when she finally meets Jesus on resurrection morning, front row seat, there's nothing more powerful than that experience, meeting Jesus. And between now and next Sunday, I want to pray for you that God will allow you the privilege of using your resources your experiences, your courage, your resilience, and all those things Mary used to bring somebody to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray for a congregation this morning. I pray for those watching online. And some of us have way more influence and potential than we realize because the enemy has clouded our thinking. He's caused us to think we're too busy. He caused, he's caused us to think if we show any emotion, we'll lose respect. He's caused us to think that if we show up for you, that people will leave us and abandon us, and we're afraid of that. The Lord, cast those things out of us, just as you cast those things out of Mary. And may we rise up as an army of the living God, 
filled with the potential and power of the Holy Spirit that we can change this world for you. We can influence people to come to know you. And I pray for every one of us that we will be influencers of influencers in the days ahead. And that we will see people that command hundreds and even thousands. They have influence that reaches far beyond where they are, far beyond what we know. And they'll come to know you through our witness, through our courage of testimony. Because of that, we're going to see a revival of the cause of Christ in Jesus' name. Everybody said together, and you jumped up on your feet and you applauded the Lord because he's so good to you. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Michael. We are his portion. He is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. And if grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. So heaven needs her like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside my chest and I don't have the time to maintain this regret cause I think about the way how he loves us oh show on this Easter week, Wednesday, 6 o'clock. If you're bringing food, be here, if you will, at 5.30. We're going to have a great week, and uh, God bless you. I'm excited about Easter and what God's going to do. Amen? So bless you. Give hugs, air hugs, air high fives, whatever you need to do. Bless somebody before you leave. So you said...